Ellis B. Feaster's Radio Air Check and Classic TV Channel. Two, five, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Hold on, Ray. Hold on, okay. Hello, Ray. I just wanted to tell you that I and I, I called a couple weeks ago. My What's, name is Chuck. What's your name? Chuck Gallagher. Chuck Gallagher? Yeah. Chuck, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to tell you I still have my cast on. What happened to you, Chuck Gallagher? Um, I just I tripped over a dog's chain. Tripped over a dog's chain and broke your leg? Yeah. Must have been a big dog. No, it was like medium size. Must have been a heavy chain. Yeah, it was metal. Metal, and you didn't, would, would you look away you were walking? No, I was just running and playing. Um, me and my friends were just throwing the ball up in the air, and the dog was running, and he just came around me and flipped me up in the air, and I landed on the ground. Oh, did you cry? Yeah. What happened after after you fell down the ground? You knew something was broken. Yeah, and, um, the lady... How, how old are you? How old are you, Chuck? Seven, I mean, eight and a half. I mean, eight. Come on, now. I want to ask you once again. I want the right answer. How old are you, Chuck? Eight. Okay. And what happened? Um, I tripped over a dog's chain. Now, were you in the backyard? Were you in the backyard? Um, yes. And you started crying. Your mother came out? Um, yeah. And then what happened? I just went, um, up to the hospital. You said, Ma, something, something happened? Did she pick you up? Yeah. How much do you weigh? I don't. I, when I broke it, I weighed sixty. Right. How much do you weigh now? Um, my mother doesn't know because when I was up at the hospital, um, I stayed up there for a couple of days and I, I didn't eat that much because I yeah. wasn't feeling good. I can understand that. Mm-hmm. How do you feel now? Good. When are they going to take the cast off? If if I'm lucky, I have to go back. Um, next Monday, and he might cut it off. What hospital? So sure. They take good care of you? Yeah. What's the name of your doctor? Doctor is. Is he a good doctor? Yeah. Does he like you? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the worst part is over because there's no, there's no more pain when they take the cast off. Yeah, I know. Oh, that'll be great. And because you, you're so young, the, the bones uh, heal and knit, knit quickly. Yeah. You won't even know anything happened in a couple of years, even shorter, less time than that. You won't even know anything that happened. I know. I just wanted to know if you could play the orangutan story. Now, there's there's two stories of the orangutan. One is of Rex Trailer and, and Sergeant Billy O'Brien. Um, that, that's one where they go to. They have to go up to uh, I don't know, upstate New York or someplace. Uh, was it? Up, yeah, I think it was upstate New York to get this orangutan. Or I just, I just wanted the one when he buys it. When he buys it. Oh, that's yeah. Billy Clyde. Yeah. Well, he goes down and he said, I hit him up alongside the head. Is, yeah. that, is that the one? Yeah. That make you laugh? Yeah. Well, all right. Since you're a good little boy, okay. eight years old, we'll do it for you, okay? Okay. All right, Billy. Bye. I mean, Chucky. Um, okay. Be a good boy. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Saturday afternoon is a great time. We hope that you're happy. If you're happy, would you nod your head up and down a little bit? Two five four five six seven eight. Hello, Larry. Yes. How are you? Let me check. Not bad, thank you. Good. How are you? Let me check. Oh, not bad, thank you. Did it twice. <laughs> what? You keep asking me. I don't change that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I tell you something about the Civil War? Sure. I bet you didn't know this. Either. What? What's your first name? Dan. From where? Milton. Go ahead. You know. uh... You know. Um, oh, is that a radio on? Is someone talking in the background, Danny? I just turned it off. Oh, thank you. You know the vice president of the Civil War was uh, the vice president president of the Confederacy. Yes. His name was Alexander H. Stevens. He was uh, imprisoned in George's Island, out in um, Boston Harbor. Where'd you get that information? I mean, I, I, I never heard that. I read it on a, in a book, Bob oh. McDowell. How how'd they get him up here? Uh, I guess he was captured towards the end of the war. Obvious. Oh, again, they took him up here to George's Island. Yep, George's Island. In prison there for a while. Then and what he, happened? It wasn't like he was uh, in jail and locked up without any food. He got a nice plush <laughs> place, so it wasn't that bad for him. How do you know? I read it in a book. Like, and you're interested in history too. Yeah, like yeah. I, I've been to Gettysburg and. Uh, oh yes. 
Pretty did, nice. Did you know that Roger Clemens of the Red Sox was a direct descendant of General Lee Lee? I never knew that. I, that's interesting. I knew he was a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that uh, uh, Roger Clemens? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tim Crime, huh? He's a Texan. Is that right? He's a Confederate. That's right. He ain't Confederate. <laughs> He's an American. The South will rise again, huh? The South will rise again. And uh, another thing is, when I went to um, Gettysburg, yes, they had a story about this girl who was making dough in her um, making dough. What do you mean making dough? In her in her house. You mean baking? Yeah, and she got shot by a rubber bullet. And it went right through her house. A rubber bullet. And killed her. She oh. was making dough inside her house, and it killed her. And then um, they found out like uh, later that um, her husband died in a battle. And she didn't know this. She was already dead and all this. It's called the Jenny Wade story. How she, I, they, they weren't using rubber bullets during the Civil War? Well, you know what I mean. No. A rebel sharpshooter shot her. Oh, accident. rebel. Yeah. Oh, rebel. What did I thought? What did I think you said? Th Confederate, you know. What uh, I mean. Rebel. Oh, I thought you said a rubber bullet. Oh. A no. rebel bullet. A rubber. I thought, oh, rubber. They used mini balls back then. Those yeah. Big uh, balls. I know it. Mother loading guns. You know? That's right. Well, yeah. All right, all right. You're uh, how old are you, Danny? Sixteen. And you're really are you becoming a Civil War buff? Yeah, I've been one. I got a Civil War hat too. Where'd you get that? Um, the M Military Institute in uh, New Jersey. It's oh. a. Do you wear it? No, it's just like a replica of a um, Union. It's a Kepi. Something for your Kepi. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, Danny. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> See you later, Larry. So long, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. A little cap for the Kepi. Hello? Hello? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, hello? This, this is Joe Ginger. Hey, Ginger. Thanks for waiting, Ginger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a... Larry, I'd like to get a T-shirt because I'm going to California, and I have a couple of numbers here from Venice Beach. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Here's what to do, Ginger. You stay on the line and and and, and speak to Rickle, okay? Thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, and I'll be. Do you go to over to Dr. Cotton's every Tuesday? I see Sometimes. you sign the window there. Yeah, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, oh, Sundays, forties, five, ninguidi nada. You know, okay, yeah, right. Thanks very much, Ginger. Then would you not? Two five four five six seven eight. Hello, hello, Gene. Yeah, hi, Larry. Hi, Gene. How are you? Let me check. <whistles> not bad, thank you. Thanks for going over, putting the Merrimack Queen in the water. We had a beautiful ride. Oh, the Merrimack Queen. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. Ho, ho, Sixteen ho. men on a dead man's chest. <laughs> Number two, on that interview you just had with that little kid. Oh, yes. What a kid. I, I was, he really touched me, too, you know, that what a kid is right. If you taped that. Yes. You play it back I'm sometime today. I think a lot of people that missed it oh, yeah. would really enjoy that. Hey Rick, can we do that? Can, can we get that off the so that interview I had with the kid? Is there any way we can get that? I'd love to. Oh, this is not funny. That Rick, do what? I'm going to give you a round of applause, Rick. He said he's going to try. I'd love to hear that again too. That kid really touched me. For the folks who didn't hear it, five-year-old kid. This is uh, in the Herald. Five-year-old kid applied the the, hem, the Heinrich maneuver to get that get that little piece of candy. He said she grabbed the piece of candy off the off the stereo. <laughs> And uh, and saved her life, and and the mother, a five year old kid. When I was five years old. I, I had a tough time knowing, I, uh, pronouncing my name. The kid knew how to do the Heimlich maneuver. The mother says, "Don't touch that little girl. Don't touch it." My he says, "I know how to do it. I saw it on TV." And he saved her life. Another thing, Larry. That's impressive. You impre it impressed you too, right, Gene? It did me too. What a sweetheart of a kid. Another thing, Larry. Can I hear Scully Square? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. That's the main reason for my call this afternoon. Rick Tennery singing his heart out on Scully Square. But you're going to be able to put on that kid, right? Well, here's what I said. Rick, it's up to Rick. He's yeah. our producer, and the back, he said he's going to try to do his best. You know, that's yeah. similar to the one that you had there where the kid saved his little dog, and then the dog saved him. Yeah, right. That's similar to that, only this kid's five years old, six years old. I know it. Boy, yeah. Oh boy. Well, listen, we're going to try to, if, if we can get that interview, if we can get that off, Rick will try. He said he's going to try to do it, and he's talented. That kid can do it. Then we'll play it. Right Very now, good. we'll get a couple of messages, then we'll uh, have a call, then we'll play the Rick Tinnery, Scully Square, okay? Very good. Thank you. Anytime. All right. Hello, Peter. Hi, Peter. Uh, hi, Larry. Hi, Peter. Hi, Larry. Hi, Peter. How are you? Let me check. 
Not bad. <laughs> How are you, Peter? Uh, I'm all right. Good. First time call. First time call? Yeah. A little round of applause for you, Peter. Where are you from originally? Uh, Romania. Romania. Good corned beef in Romania. Good potatoes and, and, and hot pastrami. Ah, uh, you have been there? No, but I eat it. <laughs> Romanian hot pastrami. Good yeah. food in, in, in Romania. How long have you been here, Peter? Uh, five years. What did you do in Romania? What did I do? Well, yeah, what kind of work? In Romania? Yes. Well, I went to school. Uh, what did you study? Went to high school. Uh, oh, I see. And then you came here. What do you do now? Uh, now I work with computers. Very good. That's and uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the Italian singer you, you are playing. The Italian singer. Yeah. Which the Italian singer? I don't know. You you play Italian songs. Oh yes, I do. Uh, I, I like Italian music. Yeah. Because but I play so much. Of, now, was, uh, is it a novelty tune, a funny tune? Uh. What, what's the name of the song? And I'll tell you who the vocalist is. Well, how does the song go? Uh, I wouldn't sing it. <laughs> no, just get, hum it a little bit. Come on, uh, Peter. How's it go? Help me a little bit. Uh, let me see. Right ahead. One. Too. Yeah, who does who does Angelica? Oh, that's Tony uh, uh, Louis Prima, Angelina. Angelina. Okay. That's oh Angelina. That's uh, Tony uh, uh, Louis Prima, Louis Prima, Angelina. And uh, Ben. Okay, there, there is another 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 one. Uh, oh, I I I know uh, Jimmy Falzone, the latest one from Sicily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Jimmy Falzone. Jimmy Falzone. He, he lives in America. No, he, he he was born in Boston. Yeah. He traveled around, he played with all the big bands, then he went to Sicily. That's where his people were from, and he worked at some resort for 10 years. And now because of the terrorists, tourism, tourism along the Mediterranean countries has decreased a great deal. And now I think he's in, uh, he's in, uh, Hon uh, in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Jimmy Falzone. Ah, so so he's an American. He, he's an American, yes. Yeah. He's an American. Uh, you like those songs, huh? Yeah, I love them. Oh, well, we're going to play. What about Rick Tenery? He's going to sing Scully Square. Do you know what Scully Square is, Peter? Uh, yeah, I heard him. I, I listened uh, to you for two years now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there aren't many Romanian people of, of Romanian nationality here, are there? Uh, no, not many. Why don't they come here? Oh, it's under communist control. Oh, they, can't, they would love to come here. They can't get out, right? All <laughs> right. Isn't it funny? Russia puts the iron curtain down and says, you're living good here. Everything is good. Everything is hot here. Yeah. And everyone says, okay, if it's so nice, open up the gate. Let me get out and take a look what's happening outside. No. You have to stay here and enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, yeah. There are so many people in Russia who would like to get out of there. And not only Russia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland. Uh, if they, Romania. And Romania, right. <laughs> if they would open it up and let people out. <laughs> oh, so. uh, there wouldn't be much many, many people. Well, right. I know that. They, no. that. But they hold them in, right? Yeah. They say, this is nice, you're enjoying yourself, relax and have a good time. Yeah. Well, all right, listen, I'm going to play. Uh, someone just wanted to hear Scully Square and Rick Tinner oh. standing by. Yeah. Oh, Larry. Peter. Uh, I uh, I didn't hear for a long time um, something uh, that you played uh, uh, Regan's apple pie, how he shares an apple pie. <laughs> to say it again, the what, Peter? The Regan's apple pie? Right. But, uh, but uh, he gives some uh, half to the poor, half to the... I don't know. Oh, it's probably one of those things that... Uh... Uh, on that first family album with that Reagan does, right? Probably. I'll yeah. see if I can find that, okay, Peter? Yeah, that, right that's, now we're gonna... that's very funny. It is. I know. I think if we can find it, the answer is yes, Peter. Okay? Have a nice day and have a pastrami, a Romanian pastrami sandwich, one for you, one for Rick, and one for me, okay? With plenty of mustard on it. All right, let's take another call. Two five four five six. Hello, Charlie. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Charlie. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. A little round of applause to make you feel welcome and wanted, Charlie. Thank you very much. Prego, prego. Uh, being a fellow pilot, yes. Um, first question was, uh, what kind of planes have you flown in, at this point? Well, most mostly uh, a single engine land. Okay. Have you, uh, in other words, you flown complex? Yes. Okay. Just curious because uh, it might not. I don't know. You might like to talk to him. I've got a son who's sixteen. 
Yes. That started flying about a year and a half ago. We yeah. own a Cherokee Six. A Cherokee Six. That's the one I, I fly a Cherokee. It's 1965 Cherokee. Well, it's a. Okay, we got a 70, 300. Oh, you son of a. Oh, you've got money, Charlie. No, I don't. Who's the one? Who, <laughs> so, someone has money. But he started on his 16th birthday. He soloed the Six, a 172, and a 152. Right. And then he's. Uh, He's taken his private written, his instrument written, he's taken his commercial written Where? this month. Where is that? Where is uh, it? All right down here out of Providence and Quonset. Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, so on his 17th birthday, he'll uh, hopefully have his private and his uh, instrument rating. Holy on mackerel. On his 17th birthday, and he hopes to be a CFII by his 18th. I'll be a son of a gun. So he's progressing. I would say so, rapidly. But how many hours does he have? Uh, about 85 right now. Well, don't you have to have 200 hours before you can take your instrument? Uh, no, they dropped to 125. Oh, we used to have, they have to have 200 before you can even take your instrument. Yeah, no, they dropped it to 125. Oh, make it a, you have to become a daredevil. They, they've got a couple of uh, new sticky rules in there, but basically he had 17 on his birthday. He, we're hoping he can do his instrument and his private the same day. But he, <laughs> he might have to wait a week to do the instrument. Well, he, does he take in the, the ground school? Uh, the, He's done it all himself. He, he hasn't done any ground schools. He's done all self-study and, and gone and take the writtens, and he's got above uh, 85 on all the writtens. So oh, that kid, that's a smart kid. So, uh, he really did. How long did it take him to study for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, written for the uh, uh, instrument? Um, he probably put, oh, you know, of course, he was doing it during school. So, But I've got to guess, you know, he's probably put maybe 40 hours into it, something like that. Yeah. Say the kid's smarter than I am. It took me a lot longer. Yeah, he's trying to get the commercial done this month because they're about to change the whole thing again. Oh, a new test, a new book, and new everything. Oh, I. Oh, good luck. <laughs> That's really great. What do you do for a living, Charlie? I'm in the lumber business and the wood business. Yeah, we have, we a... have log trucks. We uh, truck logs all over the state of Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. So I'm sitting on the side of the road talking to you. Oh, you're at the side of the road. Where's your son right now? Uh, he's back at the woodlot. At he's... the. At the woodlot. Yeah, he works out. Of, we work out of the house too. We've got a processor there, and uh, the boys sit there. They work full time for me. Oh, I was just gonna say, if we get a number, we could uh, call in there and have a little conference call. Yeah. Well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll have him. Uh, I'll have him call you one of these days. What's his name? Je Jeffrey. Jeffrey what? Uh, Je Jeffrey Codman. Codman? Yep. C O D M A N. Just like in the rich people, they're the realtors. The Codman Realty. Yeah, that's right. Are you related to them? I don't think so. Not the realtors. Uh, uh, as far as I know, I mean, we may be a relation up there. My my original family was from Boston. Uh huh. The Codmans were very an old Yankee family here. Yep, they still own some property uh, down in the in Beverly area. Right. There used to be. There's a Codman Square in Dorchester. Exactly. We're named after them. Yep. After you, right? Yep. Well, you're okay, Charlie Codman. <laughs> Hold on, so that we have a little gift for you. Okay. Appreciate it. Two five four five six. Hi, George. Hi, Larry. How you doing? Let me check. Not bad, thank you. I've always wanted to hear you say that to me. Well, it's just... First time caller. First time. You know what you get? Yep. What? A round of applause. A round of applause to make you feel welcome. Nice to have you with us, George. Thank you. Listen, I'm calling you after a, a lot of years of listening to you. Yes. I've talked to my stepfather a number of times about having you call him. I think it would be a call you'd really enjoy. Okay. Uh, he's a veteran of the Air Force, retired. And he's one of the few people alive today that has command wings. And you get them for 10 consecutive years on active flight duty and 15,000 plus hours. Holy mackerel. That's a lot of hours. Oh, yeah. Where does he live? Quincy. Oh, what does he do now? Uh, retired. Does he, he, does he, he do he anything? He worked in the printing uh, business after he got out of the Air Force. Uh, he retired from that. Uh, the only thing he does right now is enjoy himself, and uh, he's uh, in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Uh -huh. He's had quite an interesting life. Uh, had a chance to play pro baseball, went in the uh, Army Air Corps instead. He was in uh, two theaters of World War II, Korean War. Right, he dated a couple of stylets while he was flying them around for the USO. Uh -huh. what, uh, let's what's see, the, what's he was the in the Berlin Airlift. What's his name? Uh, Bill Hennessy. Bill Hennessy. Yep. I like to call him. Oh, I'll tell you, he's had a great life. Is he home now? Uh, did, did you ask I him? would say he probably is, yeah. Did you ask him if he'd like to be on? Oh, yeah, I've talked to him about it a couple of times. Now, what was that command thing? Uh, okay, it's called Command Wings. Command Wings. Yeah, now, he was on a flight crew. He was a navigator and, um, and radio operator. And regardless of your position on a flight crew, 
Right. Um, these wings have a special insignia on them, and uh, regardless of what you did, you had to have 10 consecutive years active flight duty and 15,000 plus hours. And on top of that, he's owned all kinds of airplanes on his own. Does he fly himself? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think he does anymore. Right. Uh, the last time that he went up, I was with him, right. and geez, he scared me. You know, Why? Said, what happened? He said, what does this thing say? Uh. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was pointing at. <laughs> I, Go I got real nervous. Yeah. He said, what does this thing say? What did you tell him? I said, I don't know. What is it? He said, ah, never mind. I've flown for years. I can get us down. Oh, son of a gun. That gave you a feeling of confidence. Did it give you a funny feeling over here? Uh, it did then. I got yeah. very nervous. I'd never been up in a small plane. It was a small Cessna. Right. But uh, he's flown everything. He's flown all over the world. When they used to transfer him in the Air Force, he'd take his own plane and go overseas. A little sing single engine. He'd hop around to get there. He'd fly himself over there? Oh, yeah. He He's owned more airplanes than he has cars. I'll be a son of a gun. I'd like to speak to him. Okay. So you give Helen the number. All right. What do you do? Uh, I work for a truck company. I'm a warranty manager. A warranty manager? A new truck company? Uh, well, we lease out trucks to other people. What company is it? United Truck Leasing in Braintree. Oh, very good. All right. Hold on and give that to Helen. Okay. You can line it up see if he's home, Helen, okay? Okay. Oh, and now through the remote facilities of WBZ Boston, we go to Wellington, New Zealand. Let's see if we get a hold of Mary and John Reddington. Hello? Hello? Uh, John Reddington? Yes. Yes, how do you do? This is a call of introduction. My name is Larry Glick. We're on the air now on WBZ Radio 1030. Are you familiar with this? Uh, well, it's, it's good to hear uh, a voice from Boston. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this program because our caller said that you've traveled, you and your wife have traveled to many countries. Are you familiar with my program, The Larry Glick Show on WBZ? Yes, I am. My oh. wife and I are both from Boston, so yes. we're quite familiar with it. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your job as agricultural attaché. What are you What are you doing in, in New Zealand now, John? Well, I've been here now for nearly two years. Um, I work for the Department of Agriculture, <clears throat> and we are posted overseas to 110 uh, different countries as agricultural attaches. What do you What specifically are you trying to promote? What products? What uh, What crops? Oh, everything. Anything that uh, that you can eat uh, from. Um, grains to uh, animal feeds to uh, California wines to fruits and vegetables, um, health foods, Coca-Cola, Budweiser beer, you name it. <laughs> uh, whatever the United States produces and exports, that's what we're trying to promote over here. Now, how do you promote it? What do you do? Well, we have... Um, uh, food shows where we display the products where people that produce them in the states come overseas and show their products at these shows to different people. We have menu promotions where we go to restaurants and have a uh, an American week where they would be promoting, say, beef and wine and fresh fruit and vegetables. We would have TV advertising, newspaper advertising, um, promotions in stores, those kinds of things. Hmm. Now, how would you compare living in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, with Reading, Mass? Uh, well, Wellington, New Zealand, is um, it's a slow-paced way of life. It's got uh, about 140,000 people in the town. Um, there's, uh, well, I, I, I guess... They're about 10 years behind the times in some things, and... Uh, like what? Oh, fashions, um, uh, there's no shopping on weekends. Um, what do you mean, they close? They seemed, it, it reminds me of, of uh, back in the 50s in, in terms of the family style. Uh, everyone stays uh, close to home. They uh, are family-oriented, the morality and, and the way of thinking is what it was back in the 50s, back in the U.S. Oh, yes. Are they are they pro-American? Yes, they are. Uh, it's probably one of the closer uh, allies that uh, we've had over the years. The, there's been a little hiccup in that with the uh, ANZUS thing. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that's going to all settle out uh, in the next few months. 
but the the people are very very friendly towards Americans. It's one of the last places in the world you can go when people uh, people just love Americans here. Well, uh, what's the population of New Zealand? It's uh, three point three million. Uh, and uh, what natural resources do they have? Um, most of their uh, livelihood is dependent upon agriculture. Oh, yeah. Sixty percent of what is exported is agricultural products, mostly in the form of sheep meats and uh, dairy products. What's the land mass? What, what's the size of New Zealand? Well, the, the size of the, of, of the country would be approximately, uh, it's two islands. Um, and the distance from north to south would be the same as the, uh, say, the state of Florida. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the population is about half the size of Massachusetts. So it's um, a lot of open space. Um, it's hardly ever crowded. You can go into a big city of, uh, say, Auckland that has one million people, and, and they don't feel crowded. Um, it's clean air. There's no pollution. Um, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful country. It's the best uh, place we've lived overseas in the last seven years, and we've lived in Europe. Uh, we've lived in Pakistan, and uh, and this is our best assignment in the last uh, seven years. Are there many? Uh, do many Americans vacation in New Zealand? Uh, I think the the figures were uh, close to a million Americans came here last year. By Joe. Um, and. They are anticipating that the numbers will be up quite a bit this year because of uh, the hesitancy of traveling to uh, Europe and and the Middle yeah. East. Oh, I know that. Yes. Okay. W where else have you lived, John? Yeah. On, on well, we, we we lived in uh, Holland in in the Hague. Yes. Um, we lived there for three years, and our two children were born there. And uh, when we finished in Holland, we then went to uh, Islamabad, Pakistan. We lived there for two years. How about, uh, what, tell us a little bit about that life there, Pakistan. In Pakistan. <laughs> well, uh, the way I've always described Pakistan uh, to New Zealand is, is, is when I first got to New Zealand, they would say, well, what do you think of our country? And I said, after Pakistan, this place is like heaven. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pakistan is a Muslim society where women have uh, very little rights. Um, it's a closed-in society. It's a it was a military dictatorship. Um, so troops and guns and uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, batteries were all very common things to see there. Uh, it's a very poor country. Um, if you wanted to see the way life was like back in the days of Christ, you could go to Pakistan. Uh, they're still living in mud huts, using donkeys to get around, wear the same kind of clothes, eat the same kind of food. Um, and just around the corner, you can see um, the 20th century, um, except there in places it's, you know, uh, 20 or 30 years behind the times in terms of modern technology. But um, it's a very romantic way of life for some people. For us, it wasn't. We like uh, developed countries and creature comforts. And uh, um, so we didn't probably enjoy it as much as others who like to live in developing countries and watch watch the nation progress and the people get better off. Their per capita income there was only $300 a year. Oh. So that tells you quite a bit about the lifestyle. Oh, I can imagine. Now, women are secondary citizens. How did your wife accept that? I mean, I couldn't hear what you just said. I said, uh, as you mentioned, women are, are secondary citizens. How did your wife accept that? Well, it was difficult for her in the beginning. Okay. Um, we lived in a, in a very large house with uh, seven servants, with, uh, and they were all males, um, with walls around the, uh, the house. And the first week we were there, she wanted to go out for a walk with the children, and, and the guard said, it's not safe. And all she could think of was she was going to spend the next two years behind a compound-type structure. Uh, but after she talked to a few other women who had been there for a while, uh, she went on with her own life, uh, got quite involved in embassy activities and uh, cultural-type activities and within the community. She um, had to be conscious of the clothing she wore. Um, 
you know, the temperatures there in the summertime get to about 105 to 110 uh, nearly every day. And in those kind of temperatures back in the States, you can wear shorts and halter tops and uh, nothing else. Right. And over there, if you wore something like that, you would be attacked. And you so can't. they had to wear... Really? Loose knit, yes, yeah. It, uh, they thought that you were a loose woman if you were dressed like that, and that there was open season on uh, for any male. Holy man! And um, huh. so she had to wear clothing and, and to keep her arms and her legs uh, covered. Um, and she learned how to deal with all the servants. And um, at the end of two years, we were all quite happy to leave. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you've had an amazing life. We only have one week left here in New Zealand. We're being reassigned back to Washington. And um, the day we leave here will be 4 o'clock, uh, oh, 8 o'clock at night on Saturday. And we get to California at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. So we get to California before we leave New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. Listen, John Reddington, uh, uh, now, because you're on with us, uh, you've earned a Glick University T-shirt. I'm going to make you Dean of Agricultural Affairs at Glick University. Uh, where do we send this Glick University T-shirt? Well, that sounds great. If you could send it to... Um, we may probably send it to Washington. Uh, well, or we will be in uh, Reading, Massachusetts ah, for, uh, for vacation. We'll send it to Reading. Yes, to, right. uh, to well, my wife's mother's house. Uh, her name is Rita Costello. Well, you stay on the line and uh, and give it to Eddie Mullen. He's my producer, and we'll send it to you. I want John Reddington, I want to thank you very, very much. I'm glad that we caught you, and I know that your relatives are listening at this time. And uh, uh, thank you very much, and give Eddie the information and the size, and we'll send one out to you, and, and lots of good luck. Well, I thank you very much for calling. It's uh, It's been nice talking to you, and it's nice talking to uh, someone from Boston again. We haven't uh, lived there in quite some time, and we're looking forward to coming back. Well, you'll be welcome here, John Reddington. Thank you. Thank you. Two five four five six seven eight. Hello. Hi, Larry. Hi there. Um, this is Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Um, can I ask you a couple questions? Anything, Shirley. Tell me just what uh, category. I called you a couple of weeks ago, and I, on my phone, Bill, how come it's bright in Massachusetts instead of Boston? Well, uh, Brighton is a part of Boston. Oh, sorry. Don't be sorry. Uh, we're happy here. Right. Well, I didn't mean it's, to. Yeah, it's a suburb of Boston. No. Oh. And another question. Yes. I don't know how to ask you. Have ask you ever... Me. All these women I hear, they seem to uh, attract to you. Have yes. you ever been propositioned on the radio? Yes. <laughs> I thought you probably had. Uh, yes, I did. It's it's very flattering. Did you ever take her up on it? No, I don't do that. I don't mix... Uh, 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 I have a confession. Yeah? I did. When I was... Uh, I did, yes, a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Yes. No, I was. It was... Uh, wasn't bad either. I mean, it doesn't make me a bad guy, does it? No, I think it makes you good. Yeah, right. Like, when you're good, you're very, very good, but when you're bad, you're better. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know that JoJo that was on a little while ago? Yeah, I remember that. I like the name JoJo. <laughs> well, I, I like her, too. I, I was wondering, is there any way you could get me so I could write to her for I, a pen pal? Because I think yeah. we're both a little zany. Yeah, but you can just write to JoJo. I don't know who she is. <laughs> well, I wanted, I thought maybe you could... What? Say, Get us together, like have her leave the number with that ad and oh, I Oh, no, could... no, we couldn't do that. No, no, because that would drive Eddie crazy. He's, he has enough to do as it is now. That's going on. Anybody see JoJo? JoJo. I, any... I enjoyed her. JoJo, the, JoJo the, the grizzly bear. Well, I, um, I, I didn't think there was something else I was going well, to Well, where are you calling from, Charlie? Williamson. What? what? <laughs> Where's that? You told me once. Oh, it's huh? about maybe 35 miles east of Rochester. Oh, yeah, about right. okay. two miles from Lake Ontario. I like the way you say uh, Williamson, as everyone here is supposed to know. Oh, she's from Williamson. <laughs> it's the best place I'm, that God made on the surface. Yeah, I think well, he made this part first, and sure. he gave everybody the leftovers. Uh, uh, yeah, right, Charlie. Well. So remember, you're going to go help me pick apples and cherries, so oh, you better... I'll come on and pick it. Get a little ladder and I'll pick the apples, okay? You don't, you don't use a little ladder. You use a, a straight ladder. 20 yeah. foot straight ladder. Okay, it was nice hearing from you, and I'll, I'll send you a bucket of apples, okay? 
We got the apples here. I'll send you a pound of cherries. <laughs> I'll send we you, got all the cherries and apples we I'll, need. I'll, sl I'll send you a red-blooded American boy up there. Well, I'm a widow. I'd rather have a red-blooded American man, not a boy. Yeah, well, send a Eddie, Eddie. We'll send Eddie up there. He's a, How he's old is he? 25. Okay, I, got, huh? I got children older than that. I'm 51. 51? Yeah. He says he likes older women. Good, I kind of like younger men. Yeah, I knew that. I figured that. He says that the old, older women turn them on. He says they're more experienced and they usually have a couple of bucks. Well, I'm not saying I got a couple of bucks. When you, work on a, when you work on a farm, I'll tell you, you don't have a couple of bucks. Eddie, you can tell a couple of farmer's, uh, farmer's daughter's jokes. <laughs> I can tell them here, though. All right, Charlie. <laughs> okay, bye. Hello. You. Hi. Stan. Yes, sir. Where are you in uh, in Pennsylvania? I'm in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles east of Pittsburgh. Oh, yes. Nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. Tell us about the study of the unexplained and what sort of an organization, how many, and what do you believe? Okay, well, the name of the organization is the Pennsylvania Association for the Study of the Unexplained. And uh, basically, we've been operating for a number of years. I've been involved in this study for about 26 years. And uh, the research group is made up mainly of professional people, including scientists, doctors, engineers, and other trained people who conduct open-minded studies of various type of phenomena reported by the public. Mainly, we deal with alleged sightings of UFOs and um, strange animal sightings, such as Bigfoot, uh, Black Panthers, and other animals that aren't supposed to exist in this part of the world, yet are reported almost yearly by what we feel to be competent uh, observers. Very interesting. Now, you've been uh, and you've been doing this for how many years? Twenty five. I've been doing this for almost twenty six years. Unfortunately, this is strictly volunteer. This is not our jobs, and all of our funding is out of our own pockets. Well, tell us if you will. Imagine that we're uh, uh, that we're naive listeners, and we know nothing about the, this the uh, this group. Tell us tell us about the unexplained. What should, what should we look for? What what have you seen that we haven't seen, or what have you heard that we haven't? Okay. Well, first of all. Myself, I have never seen a UFO or a Bigfoot. However, over the many years of research we've done, we've conducted literally thousands of personal investigations into sightings here in Pennsylvania, having interviewed many, many individuals, including many what we feel to be competent people, uh, police officers, doctors, air traffic controllers, others who claim to have seen some very strange objects in the sky or very close to the ground. Would you tell us about some of these, please, Dan? Okay, well, we've had... Uh, quite a number of cases of uh, objects, very large objects, which have come down and hovered very close to moving cars. One instance that we're still continuing to look at happened in October of 1983 up in, uh, outside of the city of Altoona, which is uh, quite a mountainous area. And a woman was coming back from her daughter's house when um, an object came up out of a field, came over the right side of her car. This was a round silver object. And as it came over the car, it actually lifted the right side of the car up off the ground, dropped it, lifted the car again up in the air for several seconds, throwing her under the dash of the car. Hmm. The object moved off. She was finally able to get the car over to the side of the road, but there was about a 20-minute power failure, which is quite common when these objects are reportedly around. And um, the interesting aspect is the fact that this object was making a very loud, high-pitched sound. The woman lost her hearing in her one ear, and in fact, she still has not regained it completely. She uh, began to lose her hair. She had a, a lot of unusual skin irritations, and now she's suffering from a very unusual type of uh, cancer. What did and, the doctors think caused it? Well, there's a lot of indications that there may have been exposure to radiation, and uh, it's a case that we're continu continuing to follow up. Um, that's one of many, many types of cases we've had here in Pennsylvania. Over the years, we've had alleged landings where we have been able to go to the site, and we've been able to see impressions in the ground. In some cases, there have been burnt areas, and um, we feel that there is definitely something going on. We don't know what these objects are, and I don't think there's anybody who really does know for sure what the source of these objects are. What sort of impressions did you see on the ground, Stan? Uh, in some cases, there have been, like, tripod marks. Right. where uh, there was some type of um, projections that may have uh, held the object up at certain angles. One case uh, where an object had been seen by many, many people over a, a large area 
came down into a wooded area, and several days later, several hunters found where this object had landed in a gully. And uh, it was a very unusual even to be able to come across where this thing was. It, it found a very good place where it probably would never have been seen. What, now, what about air traffic controllers? You say that they witnessed some things, too. Oh, yes. There have been many sightings, of course, not only here in Pennsylvania, but throughout the world, of uh, UFOs being reported by competent observers, uh, pilots, air traffic controllers, cases where the objects have been observed both visually and tracked on radar at the same time. And um, the sightings go on continually, even though the public is hearing very little about it. We receive... Uh, allegedly hundreds of sightings here in Pennsylvania each year, which we look into. And, of course, when we investigate these cases, we find that a high percentage of these reports can be naturally explained. Yet, each year, there remain a number of cases that do indeed remain baffling, and we feel they deserve very serious study. In your opinion, uh, Stan Gordon, what about one or two of the most outstanding uh, things that you've heard? Well, probably the most interesting case that I've ever been involved in, which has been a classic, has been written up throughout the world, uh, was an incident I was involved in back in 1973 in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. 1973, as you may recall, was a, a major year for UFO sightings in the United States and around the world. And besides all the UFO reports we were receiving, here in Pennsylvania and a number of other states, there were many, many reports of alleged Bigfoot sightings as well, these large, hairy, anthropoid-type creatures. And we still do not directly connect Bigfoot with UFOs, except there is a couple unusual cases where both Bigfoot or a Bigfoot-similar-type creature and UFOs were observed in the same area about the same time. In this one incident in October of 1973, there were about 15 witnesses out in the rural area who observed a bright red ball of light descending towards the ground. And uh, it was very large. Uh, the one farmer's son and two neighbor boys got in a truck and went up over the pasture field to approach it. And the headlights of the truck started to fade out again, which, again, we hear about this power loss in many close encounter cases. And they walked up to the top of the pasture field, and this object was now resting apparently right on the ground. It was about as large as a house, very brilliant white, and was making a very loud high pitch it sound. And uh, they stood there in amazement for a while and looked at this thing, and it was illuminating the entire field. And they began to hear these loud, crying, whining sounds, almost like a baby crying. And um, at first they were thinking in their minds, well, they must be bare. But as they approached closer and they noticed the movement, and then they could see them very clearly, they were seeing creatures that were standing upright like a man, had very long arms, very hairy, and interestingly, they both had bright, glowing green eyes. And uh, the one boy took off quite fearful what he had seen. Uh, the other boy and the former son, uh, son stood there in amazement. And uh, the former son fired a couple tracer rounds over top of the creatures at first. Then he loaded his uh, gun with a lot of ammunition, fired into the first creature. And when he hit it, it just made like a, a thumping sound. And it raised up its right hand. And the moment it did that, the object in the field just disappeared. It didn't take off. It just completely disappeared and the sound stopped. The creature slowly turned around and walked back towards the woods. Well, at that point, the two witnesses ran down to the farmhouse, told her family what happened, went to a neighbor's house and called the uh, police. It was a uh, short time later that uh, one of the police officers came up to the site and interviewed the witness and, of course, quite skeptical. But they went up into the um, field where this uh, alleged landing had taken place. And uh, when they went up there, the object was gone. All the farm animals remained outside of this uh, landing site. But when they got there, there was a glowing area, which the uh, police officer told us he thought it was about 150 feet in diameter. And he said there was a, a glowing light coming from it, that it was bright enough that if he bent down into it, he could have read a newspaper by the light mm. that this circular area was throwing off. And um, they kept hearing something heavy falling them along in the woods. And, of course, at that point, the witness was very shook up, and I think he had the policeman quite shook up himself. And um, they both got out of there, went back to the station, and contacted us, and we sent our team up that night. We went up to the site, uh, of course, checked for radiation, interviewed the people, searched the area, and uh, unfortunately, by the time we got there, which was a pretty good distance from here, uh, the glowing area had 
disappeared. Hmm. But uh, we did an extensive study on it. Uh, Dr. Berthold Schwartz, who's a well-known psychiatrist, came here. Oh, yes, I know him. And, uh, yes, he came here and did the interviews and did quite an extensive study on the case himself. What do you, what do you make of this? What do you think uh, causes these, uh, these visitations? Well, I'm pretty much convinced now that probably the majority of alleged unexplainable UFO settings may not be extraterrestrial. It's not to say there may not be some, but I am more and more convinced after we've studied now the backgrounds and to the witnesses who have had these experiences that there seems to be a very strong relationship with various types of psychic and ESP phenomena. And we don't know enough about it yet, but uh, there seems to be a lot something else involved. We might be dealing with something that's interdimensional. It seems as though we're dealing with a phenomena that has the capability of being both physical in time and non-physical with others. I hope they're friendly. I hope they like us. Well, we hope that. <laughs> well, all right. Listen, I want to thank you very much. You're a fascinating person, and you've just earned a Glick University T-shirt. We're going to make you dean at Glick University of Unexplained Phenomena. Right. I wanted to tell you, Larry, I was on one of your friend's uh, talk shows about a year ago, Chris Cross down in Pittsburgh at KDKA. Chris is a good friend. I know that he's not there anymore, though, is he? No, I heard he just recently moved out of the area. Yeah. Well, if I hear from him, I'll say that Stan Gordon of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, sends his best. Very good. Stay on the line. Eddie, would you issue him a Glick University T-shirt? Thank you very Thank much, you, Stan. Two five four five six seven eight. Hello. Larry? Yes. How are you? Let me check. <whistles> Not bad. Thank you. Good. How are you? Let me check. Oh. Not bad. Thank you. Did it twice. <laughs> Why do you keep asking me? I don't change that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I tell you something about the Civil War? Sure. I bet you didn't know this. What, what's your first name? Dan. From where? Milton. Go ahead. You know, uh, you know, uh... Oh, is that a radio on? Is someone talking in the background, Danny? I just turned it off. Oh, thank you. You know the vice president of the Civil War was uh, the vice pre president of the Confederacy. Yes. His name was Alexander H. Stevens. He was uh, imprisoned in Georgia's Island out in um, Boston Harbor. Where'd you get that information? I mean, I, I, I never heard that. I read it on a, in a book, Bob oh. McDowell. How'd, how'd they get him up here? Uh, I guess he was captured towards the end of the war. Up here, son of a gun. They took him up here to George's Island. Yep, George's Island. He was in prison there for a while. Then and what he, happened? It wasn't like he was uh, in jail and locked up without any food. He got a nice, plush <laughs> place, so it wasn't that bad for him. How do you know? I read it in a book, like... You're interested in history, too. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, I've been to Gettysburg. And, uh, oh, yes. Pretty did, nice did you know that Roger Clemens of the Red Sox was a direct descendant of General Lee Lee? I never knew that. I, that's interesting. I knew he was a rebel. <laughs> oh, did uh, Roger Clemens? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tim Cron. Huh? He's a Texan. Is that right? He's a Confederate. That's uh, right. He ain't Confederate. <laughs> He's an American. The South will rise again, huh? The South will rise again. And, uh... Another thing is, when I went to um, Gettysburg, yes, they had a story about this girl who was making dough in her um, making dough. What do you mean making dough? In her in her house. You mean baking? Yeah, and she got shot by a rubber bullet, and it went right through her house. A rubber bullet and killed her. She a was making dough inside her house and it killed her. And then um, they found out like uh, later that um, her husband died in a battle. She didn't know this. She was already dead and all this. It's called the Jenny Wade story. How she? They, they weren't using rubber bullets during the Civil War. Well, you know what I mean. No. A rebel sharpshooter shot her. By oh, a rebel. Yeah. Oh, rebel. What did I thought? What did I think is I? Th a Confederate. You know. What I mean. A rebel. Oh, I thought you said a rubber bullet. Oh. A no. rebel bullet. A rubber. I thought oh, rubber. They used mini balls back then. Little yeah. Big uh, balls. All right, I know it. Muzzle loading guns. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. All right, all right. You're uh, how old are you, Danny? Sixteen. And you really are you becoming a Civil War buff? Yeah, I've been one. I got a Civil War hat too. Where'd you get that? Um, the M Military Institute in uh, New Jersey. It's oh. a. Do you wear it? No, it's just like a replica of a um, Union. It's a Kepi. Something for your Kepi. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, Danny. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> See you later, Larry. So long, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. A little cap for the Kepi. We're calling Tommy's joint to find out, do they really sell buffalo meat? <laughs> 
And Wanda's Oh Christina is here Right Okay <laughs> It's ringing Yeah uh, Is this Tommy's joint? Yes Hi My name is Larry Glick We're on the air now In Boston On Radio because I can hear you. Uh, my name is Larry Glick, and we're in Boston on WBZ Radio, and uh, we have a listener, and they say... Uh, I want to move to another phone because I can hear you on oh, this phone. Okay, I'll, I'll wait. Down, okay? I'll wait. I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey. You better be ready by half past eight. Now, baby, don't be late. I want to be there when the band starts playing. Don't forget when... Okay. Hi there. Hi. We're on the air now on radio station WBZ in Boston. My name is Larry Glick. We do a talk show, and we call interesting places. There's a young lady on the phone from San Francisco. Her name is Christina. Christina, say hello to this gentleman. Hi. Yes. What, what's your first name? My name? Yes. Yeah, my name is Hector. Hector. Yes. Is it, is it true? Do you serve buffalo? It's hard to hear you. Uh, do you serve buffalo meat at, at, at this place, Tommy's Joint? Do you serve? Yeah, we still sell, uh, sell uh, buffalo stew. You sell buffalo stew? Yeah, it's a, it's a buffalo meat. Hector, where, where do you get the buffalo? From Wyoming. Wyoming? Yes. Where, where, where are you from, Hector? Where, where were you born? Oh, uh, I'm born in Guatemala City. In Guatemala? Did they ever serve buffalo meat in Guatemala City? No. No. No, never. What does it taste like? Pardon me? What does the buffalo meat taste like, Hector? Uh, it's like, like beef, just a little bit sweet. Now, would you, would you, uh, what, what would you prefer, if steak or buffalo meat? Oh, I prefer the buffalo. Uh, you... Yeah, it's because it's more tender. How do you prepare it? Can, can you tell, can you speak to us for a minute or two? Yeah, it's like, uh, we prepare like a, a stew. Right. Uh-huh, with potatoes. How much do you charge for a bowl of buffalo stew? Uh, four sixty-five plus tax. Uh-huh. Now, is, is, are you, what is your job there, Hector? Are you the... Pardon me? What is your job? Do you own the place? I, or... No, no, I'm a, uh, uh, the head bartender. Aha! Uh -huh. I see. How long have you, how long have you been there at, at the... Uh, I'll be here about four and a half years in this place. Now, Hector, what else do they serve beside buffalo meat? Um... We serve sandwiches like uh, turkey, yes. um, barbecue brisket, corned beef, pastrami, uh, and the, plus the special there, we have a, uh, like, uh, like tonight we have a buffalo chili, you know, like a chili that takes us. Buffalo uh, we, chili, we, yeah. yeah. we make it with a buffalo, buffalo chili, and a veal cutlet, a steak sandwich, a meat, meatball spaghetti, and the turkey legs. Is the is the uh, buffalo chili a big uh, a big item? Oh yeah, yeah. We sell a lot of uh, buffalo chili. How much do you get for the buffalo chili? Uh, we charge only three twenty five. Yeah, three twenty five plus tax. Do, do any people ever complain of of agita? You know, Pardon me? do you know what agita is? Agita, uh, indigestion. Any people ever get buffalo? Oh no, 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 indigestion? no. no. We don't have any complaints huh? No. Uh huh. Well, that's very very nice. Listen, uh, because you are so nice, Hector. Uh, my name is Larry Glick, and when we interview interesting people like you, we give them a Glick University T-shirt. And oh. if, if you stay on the line, I'd be honored to give you one. My producer, Stu Fink, will give you a Glick University T-shirt from Boston. Uh, I don't hear you. Yeah. Oh, just stay on the line. Stu, would you take care of, of Hector? Yeah. Uh, Stu, thank you very much. Let's say hasta luego. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, amigo. Okay.